our palatial recording studio high atop our mountain lair on a remote volcanic island, this is Talk Universe. I'm Sir Charles Schultz. And I'm Eliza, your co-host. This is our show for Wednesday, May 3rd, 2017. Tonight's topic is Smart Materials. Yes, this is going to be a great show. I love all the shows. Smart Materials, this is one of those fascinating topics. Our world and its technology is changing so rapidly. We now have materials that can do a lot of the work for us. Materials that respond in ways that natural materials do not. Eliza? What can I do for you? What is the definition of smart materials? Smart materials are designed materials that have one or more properties that can be significantly changed in a controlled fashion by external stimuli such as stress, temperature, moisture, pH, electrical or magnetic fields. Shape memory alloys, electrochromic materials, and electro-rheological materials are examples of this. That's great. Imagine things that change their properties with the application of pressure or voltage or heat. Things that can change their transparency, their hardness, their conductivity. Smart materials allow us to build things unlike any we've seen before. Devices that actually seem to be alive or responsive. So this is going to be a great show, and we also have an interview from a fellow a nanotechnologist. Eliza, who's yes, our sir. guest tonight? Our guest tonight is Charles Ostman. Very good. Could you read our guest it's bio? It's my pleasure. Yes, could you read our guest bio? I should read the biography for the listeners. Exactly. Charles Ostman is a nanotechnologist and futurist who worked on the United Nations Millennium Foundation. His work has covered many fields of expertise from shape memory alloys to biology. He speaks to forward-thinking and innovative groups on technology and its implications. Well, Charles Ostman is always a welcome guest on the show, and this is going to be great fun. So, let's dive right into the material. We've got a wonderful interview. Uh, I would say that of the people that I've talked to, Charles Osman has one of the widest ranges of subject matter and technical expertise of uh, just about anybody I've spoken with. So he's always uh, a lot of fun to listen to. And I encourage uh, listeners to go to the website and have a look at his bio. We've got a, a really in-depth uh, bio page for him. I'll hit a few highlights here before we get started. Charles Osman has over 35 years of experience in the fields of electrics, physics, materials, science, computing, and various forms of applied AI and artificial life including eight years at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories in the University of California, Berkeley, and Los Alamos National Laboratories. His primary focus is on specialized materials, including DSME, which is shape memory effect metallic alloys, and we're going to be speaking about that, and various material systems with unique electronic and photonic properties. Uh, at Los Alamos, this experience was applied to work on the Antares Laser Project, the world's largest and most powerful defense laser system, successfully demonstrated at the time which was during the SDI and Star Wars uh, development program. So that just gives you a taste of what it's all about. So let's get right down to the interview. Our guest tonight on Talk Universe is Charles Ostman. And uh, Charles, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, uh, so I hear you've always got some interesting projects. What's going on in your life lately? Well, some I can talk about and some I can't. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> the way it is. What's kind of strange or uh, just different is that in earlier times, I spent a lot of time actually in a lab somewhere designing things or blowing things up sometimes. It depends on what I was working on. But now a lot of my time is spent on patents. And in fact, some of my patents have already been granted. Some others are sort of still in process. And of course, now there's lots of attorneys hovering about overhead. So I, I have to be sort of somewhat limited in some areas that I just can't go into. But in general, um, I have been working on my favorite thing for a long time. And now I actually haven't had a chance to really do this is in what's commonly referred to as photonic band gap materials. I mean, even though we are, the general thesis of our talk today was going to be on smart materials, and going back many, many years, you know, several decades, I actually worked on, I was one of the first sort of lab people to actually work with nitinol, which is a dual-shaped memory effect material made from a nickel-titanium alloy. It's, it's quite common now, but back then it was considered exotic. And in fact, I had a piece of the original nitinol foil, a very rare piece, which sadly I lost when I moved from Berkeley to here, I'm now in Sebastopol. Oh, that is a loss. But I had a chance in the early 70s to sort of see the first attempt to really make this stuff usable in a much wider range of applications. So I've, I've had kind of a history in the so-called smart materials universe. 
But as you well know, some of our materials have, of course, gone into a very wide range of different kinds of things, uh, which can be basically materials that can be tro- controlled through some kind of external mechanism, whether it's electrical, thermal, chemical, kinetic, or some com- or magnetic, or some combination thereof. Can a, pr- can a material change its property? Can it go from soft to stiff? Can it go from two or more different shapes depending upon external signal? Can it change its photonic properties? Can it go from opaque to clear? Or can it change its refractive index? That's one of the ones I've been looking at recently. Uh, you know, things like that. Uh, yeah. But in the world of photonic bandgap materials, what's commonly called quantum dots nowadays is, is a kind of a big deal because what this means is you can take these nanoscale particles of semiconductive materials which can absorb a very broad spectrum of light, but then re-emit a photon of a particular uh, frequency of light. And so you can look at it as a kind of like a photonic logic gate, for better choice of words. And in fact, people now commonly refer to photonic bandgap materials as kind of like a photonic semiconductor. And the reason this is a big deal is because, in my opinion, and maybe some might agree as well, that the next big thing is really going to be a, a, dra- a dramatic paradigm shift. I hate to use those words because it's been so overused. <laughs> but in today's world, with your smartphone, your desktop computer, your car, your refrigerator, your toaster, virtually everything has got some kind of a computer in there. But these are all computers based on logic replicated in silicon. That is, you have a silicon chip. It has a transistors and memory and so forth that sort of etched into its surface. And you're limited really by the physical properties of the semiconductor. You can only push so many electrons through a PN junction at such a rate before you have so much thermal um, cost that you have to radiate a lot of heat to get the chips to operate faster. Sure, they'll burn up. And yeah. even, even, even with your fastest, super snazzy, I don't know, G8 phone or whatever the latest thing's going to be, uh, you're only going to you're going to hit a certain plateau, where it's just not going to be functional anymore. The the cost for making ever smaller size features in your wafers, you know, now they're down to like nan- nine nanometers, which is a big deal. But the cost for making a fab system like that's enormous. It's billions of dollars. And like I said, you're going to have a certain heat cost characteristic where you just can't go beyond a certain threshold. You, you can only go to so many gigahertz. And you can only go through so many operations, you know, floating power operations per second or whatever the measurement might happen to be. And people often use um, the, the so-called uh, test where they say, you know, how many transistors can you fit on a chip, that sort of thing. I sort of argue against that. I My argument is what level of complexity can you fit onto a chip of a given size or sure. a given dimension? So that's where the photons suddenly become much more interesting. So even though the idea of photonic bandgap materials goes back many decades, it's only been the last decade or so that it's become commercially viable, at least to make the quantum dot, which are one-dimensional photonic bandgap materials. But, but, in the world of 2D, and more importantly, 3D photonic bandgap materials, that is an actual photonic chip, a physical chip, that's, imagine something like the size of a postage stamp, but has millions and millions of these little tiny vacuoles inside the chip. And those vacuoles are all specifically uh, capable of responding to photonic logic. This is a big deal, because now you can operate in terahertz as opposed to gigahertz, and the thermal cost is essentially non-existent. It's, it's so small, it's, it's negligible. And the, the, the limitation on getting at this from a commercially available perspective is the manufacturing process. Um, and that's where things are going to change, I think, in a big way. That's just my personal opinion. And I, I recall many times in the past when I've had folks, I used to work in the artificial life and artificial intelligence world a little bit. So in those past times, the arguments were often, well, you can get this many more, you know, flops per area of silicon, you know, blah, blah, blah. Actually, I used to argue it was, a, it was a material science question as opposed to a computer science question. That was always with a kind of a raised eyebrow. <laughs> Although, there were other folks that sort of tended to agree with this. And now, this is no longer a theoretical idea. So, it might be five or maybe ten years out, somewhere in that area. But before long, you will start to see photonic logic become the new thing. And more importantly, you're also going to see what I might refer to as photonic neural networks. And that's where I'm particularly interested. So um, if I had to say, what am I working on now or what would I like to be working on in the near future, that's where I'd like to be going. Well, let me ask an area you a question. Photonic I, devices. I think this is a good question uh, to put to you at this point. And I know a lot of people have heard of the quantum dots, as, uh, particularly in laser applications. But uh, when you start talking about computing using photonics, how would you say that would compare to quantum mechanical computing? 
Because quantum mechanical computing, you're relying on the well, several things actually, but but the ba the most basic start point is you're trying to get electrons to go from a donor site to a receptor site across a p-n junction. You're, you're trying to trying to get the outer shell of one the atoms of one material substrate to say here's here's some electrons, and then the, on the other side you have a bunch of valences with holes, and the electrons are sort of filling up the holes. But you can only shovel through so many electrons effectively at a given rate of time with a certain energy cost. It's just there's laws of physics start to get in the way. Sure. Whereas in photons, there is no limitation. <laughs> it sounds it sounds kind of kind of crazy in a way, but you're it's an entirely different kind of problem. You're not trying to force um, atoms to surrender their electrons or receive their electrons at an ever faster rate, compressing ever uh, shorter time scales with ever higher thermal costs. And no matter how efficiently you design your features or to what specialized dopants they use in your next generation semiconductors, the rules of physics just get in the way. Whereas in the case of photons, you're not limited by the rules of physics, you're really limited by the rules of fabrication technology. And that may be a sort of a different way of looking at it. But one of the things I'm most bent on is the idea, well, two things. Uh, quantum computing, of course, is another subject which can sort of park off the side for the moment. But in terms of things that mimic living systems, neural networks that actually really do learn, that process information from the outside world, as it were, and learn from it and become ever smarter at whatever it is that they're able to process and then adapt to. So there's a concept called adaptive resonance, which is a common term used in neural networks in general. But again, the limitation on neural networks has always been how many electronic processes can you devote to mimicking a neural or a synaptical architecture. And of course, there is giant supercomputers now which do this, and at great cost, of course. I mean, imagine a, a building with a, you know half the floor dedicated to a bunch of supercomputers which are digitally trying to replicate what looks like an analog process, actually, by replicating what synapses do when they communicate to each other. Yeah. Well, in this context, forget all that. Something much smaller, something that could fit into something that you could hold in your hand easily, could, in a sense, replicate what is now being pushed at by the largest and most power-hungry supercomputers that exist, trying to imitate what a brain does, but now you do with photons in a handheld thing at a very tiny energy cost. That's where I think the future is going. Well, I think uh, that sounds fascinating, and it sounds like it's very promising, too. Um, I know that a lot of people are not really aware of the things that go on in the semiconductor world, and they're not really aware of some of the applications that happen in that regime. Now, most of them are aware of shape memory alloys, metals that can change shape with the application of a little heat or current, and sure. we've seen demonstrations of that. Some of the things that fascinate me are like electrochromic materials where you add a voltage and it changes the color. And they did some, they did some ceramics years ago that did the same sort of thing, made displays out of right. it. And we've recently heard of materials like smart concrete that repairs itself when it's broken. And they have tiny beads full of bacteria that are implanted in the concrete. And if it's ruptured, the bacteria come out and rebuild in the crack. Um, and a lot of people refer to this whole process with smart materials is anisotropic design because some of the materials themselves actually take part in the design process polymorphic materials materials that heal themselves and I know everybody sure. has, you know, so in the world of, of self-assembling and self-healing and self-orienting material systems there's a whole range of things that sort of do this um, I happen to lean towards the biology side of things just because that's what I'm kind of familiar with and it's also what I think again where the next thing is going to be um, oddly enough, in the world of synthetic biology, I'm sorry, I sort of deviate off the track here just a little bit, but in the world of synthetic biology, there's a lot of materials folks who are taking a really close second and third look at this idea. That is, can you have a molecular material, a proteomic substrate of sorts, which responds to some kind of biological influence and in a self behaves like a biological mechanism, even though it's not a living thing per se, but in other words, can we harvest things from the biological world and apply them to the smart materials universe? And I think the answer is yes. So there's some evidence of this. In fact, uh, MIT just published a piece on this just a few minutes ago, I just was looking at it myself, um, where the sort of the latest uh, generation, if you will, of smart proteomic materials, which can be communicated to by DNA. In other words, you, you expose the, the, a section of the DNA.
um, where the sort of the latest uh, generation, if you will, of smart proteomic materials, which can be communicated to by DNA. In other words, you, you expose the, a section of the DNA to the proteomic substrate, and it begins to actually change its material, uh, its properties. Uh-huh. Um, so, it, it could biological programming or sort of biocomputing, if you want to look at it that way, be part of this larger smart materials universe? I think so. I think this is something that, again was being looked at quite a few years ago, there was a whole sort of subset of that called chemical computing, of which using DNA as a computing mechanism was a piece of that puzzle. But it was kind of limited. It was it was seen as, can we do basic logic but using biological materials? Now this extended into a larger arena that can we have controllable features, just like what you're talking about, changing shape, changing re- receptivity to light, changing surface properties, that kind of thing, but actually using a biological substrate as a sort of an, a way to get at that property. And I would say yes. So I I love the fact that you were into the artificial life picture, and I you know that's one of my favorite disciplines, looking at how we can create systems that that grow and change and mimic what uh, biology does. And you know I found a rather disparaging description of artificial life as a science without facts. But <laughs> <laughs> what well, I, I just have to know. laugh at that one because I've already seen plenty of examples uh, where that's exactly. actually being done in a laboratory. Uh, but, you know, it depends on who you ask and in what context. Uh, um, there's a, I'm going to say this kind of carefully. There is a gap between what goes on at various academic research sites, and, and be, most people won't see this unless they spend the effort to kind of go to these different rather obscure, excuse me, obscure academic journals or, or fairly obscure sort of scientific journals and sort of dig around and search for it and say, ah, oh, here's an evidence of somebody's lab doing X, Y, Z, <clears throat> versus what might get filtered out to the public um uh, typical media, as it were. And then a sort of a subset of that is how much of this actually is disappearing into corporate uh, finance laboratories, which is kind of where I am now. And as as sort of a strange sidelight to this, because of the change in patent laws, which dates back to March of 2014, and something which I'm painfully aware of now, actually, uh, a lot of things that were probably more openly published in earlier times may be a little more restrictive because of the concern over capturing intellectual property and it gets kind of confusing that way. So sure. I'm not sure how much of this stuff filters out into the general world versus how much is sort of hidden away. Not as a part of some dark conspiracy per se, but just as a as an artifact of the changing laws and then just the, the economy of, of how technology is, is financed and how it's replicated out into the outside world. And then, of course, you really do have the DOD slash DARPA universe, which very often, in fact, it just happens to people that file patents sometimes. If you cite something that's particularly interesting from a strategic imperative perspective, they will come in and say, well, look, uh, we like what you're doing, but we don't want you to express this publicly. <laughs> but right. just, and take it over here. You know, So I've seen that a few times. So you know, this just depends on who you ask and in what context. Sure. Well, let me ask you something else. Um, I've, uh, you know, a lot of people are aware that there are things like glass that becomes transparent or opaque on command, or even silver on command. I saw a fascinating thing where they developed a plate of glass that had a metal film sandwich inside, and when when you applied a current, hydrogen atoms would be absorbed by the metal, it would turn silver, like a mirror, and then you remove the current, and it would become transparent again. We don't really see a lot of this reaching us, because I suppose there are some manufacturing difficulties and some durability issues as well. And possibly toxicity issues. One of the things that I've run into in some of my past projects, even though the patents went through and the people liked it and everything was lovely for a while, then when it stepped into the somewhat murky territory of regulatory compliance, that suddenly became an issue. So I, I don't see, don't know much about the silver material you just mentioned, but I can reflect on other projects that I got involved with where up to up until a certain point, it was everything was looking really interesting just because we could do it in a lab and sort of express the concept you know, as a workable thing. But then when it came to the legal side and saying, well, if you suddenly get this out into the public world where the liability exposure is in fact, you know, so I don't know how much of that plays into the material sure. you just mentioned, but I do know that it's kind of an issue sometimes. Well, that certainly but, could uh, but, be the case. But just yeah. to kind of step backwards a little bit, the whole idea of phototropic membranes or windows or things that can change color or change opacity on command, that, that's been around for a long time. But like you said, which particular version is going to be more commercially viable or does it require rare earth materials or you know, specialized elements that are hard to get? And, and maybe before. This is one thing I might want to just branch off into for a second. One of the things I really haven't been paying attention to since I work in this kind of stuff a lot 
it may not be the thing for the moment, but it will become the thing in the very near future. A lot of the stuff that we see in our daily lives, including our smartphones and our electronic gadgets and some of the more exotic materials we're probably talking about, it requires, unfortunately, access to a lot of specialized materials and special rare earth elements, which are only located in a few places around the planet. Right. And in many cases, these locations are in very politically um, difficult areas or where there's a lot of conflict or where the process of acquisition involves some pretty shady activities, you know, amongst the particular entities in question, that kind of thing. Right. So yeah. we're going to have really have to become much more uh, focused on finding alternatives or ways to be less dependent on these rare earth materials. As I see it, we're kind of in a stopgap measure. We, we're really clever now at inventing ever more interesting material system schemes that are quite interesting. But if you start scaling them up into commercial size applications, you suddenly run into this uh, potential world of which, which part of the world do you have to go to to dig up the rare element, whatever it is, and then what kind of weird process do you have to go through to make that element usable in some other materials configuration? So I think that's if there was any area of science I'd be kind of looking towards, it's not so much can you make the glass change its opacity on command, but rather can you do that with a less um, troublesome way of getting at the materials or the fabrication process? That's just kind of my overview of seeing that. There's lots of materials out there. The, one of the other areas I'm really bent on, by the way, is artificial muscles. I think that's as robotics become ever more the thing to do, and that's what exactly what's happening, and sort of tipping into the physical side of artificial life, if you will. And that's one of the reasons I got involved with some of the pratyama materials a while ago, is because is there a way to create things that can move, perform kinetic activity, but it does not have to require the traditional mechanisms of gears and pistons and pneumatics and all that sort of stuff. Well, and, of course, obviously, that's where the shape memory effect uh, metals come in. Sure. But there's other materials, you know, polyacrylamides, and there's a whole bunch of other materials which have similar properties uh, under different characteristics. Um, I would offer the idea, just if you want to take the 10,000 foot view, that if we fast forward like maybe 10 years from now, something like this, or some length of time, at the same time we're going to possibly start seeing photonic computing things, photonic processing elements, become part of the next generation of computing fabric that's sort of out there in the general world, and then you marry that with smart materials, things that behave biologically, smart muscles, uh, smart things that can change their shape or their physical properties on command. You put those two together, and that's when you really do have the sort of potential, if you will, of something that resembles artificial life in whatever right. context it might be. So, yes, I think we're reaching the point where that's very, very likely. And, you know, we've both seen some fascinating materials come out lately. Um, and a lot of the stuff really is actually quite simple. I've noticed that uh, the new muscle tissue, the new artificial muscle tissue, isn't the gamma irradiated specialty polymer. It actually turns out to be twisted fishing line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I remember working with polyacrylamides a while ago, and the thing with the polyacrylamides at the time was that they had a sort of a short lifetime, but it was a very promising step towards something where these kinds of polymer-like materials could become uh, much more viable and have, you know, essentially infinite uh, repeat cycles to them, and they could exert enough amount of work, uh, mechanical work, versus the energy required to get them to go to state phase transition, so that you could actually make them usable in things like motors or things that walk around or just whatever. That, so, I mean, I actually got out of the smart polymer stuff a while ago, but I could see that trend approaching. So maybe the more recent versions are getting closer to that as we speak. So, yes. Okay. Now, another other interesting thing I see, and I mentioned the smart concrete, we had spoken just briefly, and uh, this is not necessarily new news, about impact armor. And I know there was an Israeli group making a tungsten disulfide nanomaterial, and right. it basically was uh, like a t-shirt that was bulletproof, and it had like 350 tons per square centimeter of impact resistance. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, if you uh, have Yes, I saw a demonstration of this, actually, at UC Berkeley, just before I left. I, I moved out of Berkeley, and now I'm in the middle of vineyards out here in Sebastopol, but <clears throat> I used to uh, spend quite a bit of time on the UC campus, even after I left working there. So I, I would go to the engineering department, and they would have these guest lecturers and people would come in and demonstrate their latest properties of these materials and so on. So one of the ones I saw that I thought was really fascinating was essentially just what you're talking about, the tungsten disulfide. And it was essentially, imagine a, like a, a 
a diving suit or a, a sort of like a like a like a wetsuit kind of material. You know, it's pretty spongy, kind of soft, like a gel, really. But then, if you shoot a bullet at it, it would harden up in microseconds and it would stop a bullet. Now, one of the limitations was once a bullet hit, there would be a zone around the impact site where it would be brittle, and the next bullet that came in would just shatter right through it. So they were working on a multi-layered version or, or, or different implementation so they could get multiple yeah. bolts within a certain range of space and spatial range and it would still work. But it, you know, it was quite fascinating. And so I saw that and thought, well, DARPA's going to pick up on this and sure enough they did. So, yes, <laughs> I've so seen the guy the new... came and gave a demo and then he left again. So I'm, I'm sure they're working on it now. I have no doubt. That's probably they, something they... Yes, they have. And I've seen what looks like the Iron Man suit and it is a an armored exoskeleton that has this flexible rubbery bulletproof material in between the joints yeah. so that's probably exactly where it ended up yeah no i i, I thoroughly agree i one of the other trends that i see happening a lot and i have a lot of friends who are pilots and they've been aircraft enthusiasts for many many years and they build their own planes and all this kind of stuff but what's happening as i'm sure you all know is is the whole idea of having a pilot in a plane is, is really going to become passe give it another five to ten years something like but you know, even though we're, we're squandering half a trillion dollars in the so-called F-35, which is a whole topic by itself, I won't go into it. But <laughs> I, I, we could go into a lot of discussion about that. But the point is, all this seems kind of silly because in the next handful of years, the things you see flying around are not going to have people in them. No. Uh, at the very least, they're going to be piloted by somebody on the ground. Much more likely to be piloted by a form of AI actually in the plane itself. Absolutely. Or much more likely a distributed form of AI where you have multiple nodes of intelligence that act as a collective organism, almost like a swarm, really, and they they can communicate in real time over different uh, channels of communication and really be like a collective organism that swarms in and does whatever the military mission happens to be. So in that context, um, a lot of the smart materials and sort of smart things, this is kind of the next place you'll probably see it occur in a way that the average person could, or at least the outside world, will see evidence of it. Um, but the idea of protecting people as opposed to putting people in battle, whether it's smart machines that walk around on the ground, like best, like Boston Dynamics with their various robotic critters, that sort of thing, sure. or um, suits that are exoskeletons, that are smart exoskeletons, so that maybe only a handful of soldiers have to go into an area instead of a entire battalion, and the super soldiers are outfitted with these smart suits, as it were, or uh, sh things that fly in the air and are fully autonomous. That whole genre of stuff, That if there was anyone collective industry that's kind of pulling the smart materials along in a much faster pace. That's where it's going. Absolutely. Okay. Now, I also um, read something fascinating about the um, programmable liquids. Um, these are electro-rheological fluids, and they're fluids that basically um, the first application I saw was adjustable shock absorbers. They had a fluid in the absorber, and on the application of a current, it would stiffen up and give you a stiffer ride. And when you removed the signal, it would liquefy again, and you get a gentle ride. Uh, any thoughts about those electroneurological fluids? Yeah, I, I haven't had any personal interaction with it, but it certainly sounds like a very credible application. It's certainly the kind of thing that would filter its way out into the general world. And I would, I would offer the idea that since autonomous vehicles is now the, the next big commercial thing, I mean, virtually everybody that's in the business is... is pushing very fast to be the first in the block with their version of an autonomous vehicle. Things like smart fluids to make the vehicles more manageable, to increase their capacity to stop or to interact very quickly or, or safely within a certain set of parameters, that kind of thing, that's absolutely where this sort of smart material stuff would find its home. Um, whether it gets into the ordinary automotive user, probably, I, I can't see, unless it's really expensive, I don't know what the cost is going to be. But I, I think as we step further and further into the world of autonomous machinery in general, that's going to fuel the interest in venture financing and in various corporate entities to put more money into making these smarter materials more commonly accessible because they'll have to be utilized in these autonomous systems. If there's, there's, they, in other words, if nothing else, just to shield themselves from any liability potential in the future, they have to make these smart systems capable of interacting with the physical world in a much safer way than any person can possibly do in current times, including things like materials that can harden up on command or things like this so that their physical properties are more manageable. Sure. Hold it right there. We're going to do a break. Eliza. What shall I do for you? Please announce the break. 
You are listening to Talk Universe. I'm Eliza, your co-host. We will be right back. Sure. Now, one of the things that really fascinated me when I first heard about it was, uh, it's similar to the self-repairing concrete, but it was uh, putting sensors and materials in bridges, such as the steel structural material that actually could heal damage or respond with flexing rather than shearing off or breaking. And it seems to me that we should be really pushing ourselves to get these things into our infrastructure. If there was one area that I would probably want to just rant and rave about, it's our infrastructure, because we have so badly mismanaged our keeping. The infrastructure only works as long as you maintain it, just like owning a house or owning a car or anything else, only on a much larger scale. So if you have all these bridges and viaducts and tunnels and everything else, which are rusting away and collapsing and falling apart, which sadly is what the case is, is it time to retool these things with a smarter material systems approach, I would say absolutely. Uh, whether or not we actually have the political will or the economic moxie to really pull it off, I honestly don't know. But I would certainly uh, go in your direction and say that yes. I mean, I, I, anything that can make a material more manageable, that's really what it amounts to me, is whatever that management process happens to be. Now, in the world of sensors, maybe I should go in a different direction. In the ability to harvest information from the outside world, whether it's piece of letter films or things that can translate, you know, vibration into energy, or sensors that can pick up even the tiniest amount of electronic or magnetic information and convert that to something that something else could use, that sort of thing in the sensor side of things, that's the area that I probably have spent more time in than on the smart materials version of it. But, but. I agree with you that mixing those things together is kind of where things, things that can heal themselves. There's a, a woman I know, by the way, um, over in England, and she was working on something called protocells, which is kind of what you're talking about. Um, these are, it wasn't concrete exactly, but it was more like a gelatinous material that behaved like a living system. And kind of like jello in a way, you could, she could pour it into a substrate and then it would react with other biological materials around it and then become stiffer and eventually become a hardened thing. But the idea is it would grow. It would actually move around and kind of fill up cracks and it would kind of ooze its way into various areas that uh, needed to have more structural support. It would kind of be able to sense its surroundings and, and kind of like the way that a, a tree or a plant grows its roots into an area and, be, and the roots kind of go everywhere her material would do the same kind of thing. And it was called protocells, and she actually got a project funded in Venice wow. because the, the buildings there are sinking. It's yeah. kind of a big problem, actually. <laughs> so they started putting her protocell stuff into some of the timbers because the way the buildings are set up there, many of these buildings are on ancient timbers that, that date back several centuries. Sure. And it's astonishing the city's still even floating. I mean, it's, it's kind of bizarre because all these buildings should have already sank, but they're sinking now. So they tried her stuff. It seemed to work, and now she's getting more funding. But so, kind of the same idea. That is a material that can, on its own, find the best places to absorb into the surrounding materials, and then sort of harden up and become a, a reinforcement agent. So yeah, so that that context of stuff is certainly something to be uh, seen more of. Something that really fascinated me uh, from way back in my semiconductor days, uh, manufacturing chips, was Purple Plague. And you may be familiar with that, uh, when they were wire bonding the uh, connections to the chips. And you often had tin-based material. Um, you would get dendrite growth. And the dendrites, right, little, little hairs. That's exactly yes. right. I've heard that, yeah. It seemed to me that's something that we could probably learn to exploit the properties of so that it actually did something useful rather than shorting things out. Because <laughs> well, can only hope. Well, we well, it's I, funny. I, on a sort of a weird side yeah. note, um, it, as a way to address that, I do recall uh, that back when I did work in semiconductors, the, the biggest problem wasn't the actual fabrication of the chip itself. It was the packaging. In other words, the packaging actually cost more than a chip. That was that was that always kind of surprised me. Actually, so <laughs> well, just the way it is. So one of the things I worked on actually was super molecular chemistry. Which, okay, now I have to explain what that is. So there are what's called super polarons, and these are log chain polymers that are like spaghetti, and they kind of wrap around each other. But at certain junction sites where the spaghetti gets really twisty and sort of curled around itself, suddenly the valences crisscross each other. And so you get these these zones where electrons are just sort of darting around from one valence to the next. In which case, 
electrons sort of popping in like a vacuum of sorts. And so an electron popping in from one side will just fall through through the other side. So it behaves like a superconductor or like a semi-superconductor. I'm sure. using a bad word, sir. But it was like nine-tenths of a superconductor, but it would operate at room temperature. That's the whole important thing. And it was a polymer. You know, this is like a, like a glue, like a, like a paste kind of material. And so Intel took a real interest in this and said, wow, this is fascinating. We should have a second and third look at this. So it was actually a pair of Russian scientists, a man and wife team, very nice people, actually. I spent a lot of time with them. And they had a lab right near here in Santa Rosa. And they think that we could demonstrate that on rare occasion, suddenly a vacuole would appear. It might only be 10 nanometers across by, say, 30 nanometers long. But inside that vacuole, yes, electrons would just fall in and fall right out again. It was astonishing when it actually worked. The problem was trying to get the vacuoles to line up in some sort of organized pattern. So we dreamed up a variety of experiments. We were going to have standing, you know, speaking of microwaves and so on, we were talking about earlier, we were thinking of having like a standing wave pattern replicate through the material that would kind of force the vacuoles to line up. And we had all kinds of ideas going. But we never quite got to the point where we actually set up the lab to do the experiments. They actually left, and I don't know where they went, actually. But Intel came in, and they, they thought at one point that if they could create a coating or like a layer of this polymer material and use that as the bonding site for the chip, that would skip 90% of their you know chip packaging processing costs. And it was a great idea. I mean, I, I love the fact that they took an interest in it. But like I said, we only got as far as being able to show an occasional vacuum that would sort of show up at a random spot within a certain two-dimensional region of this material. And I, I don't know what became of it, but it was a fascinating little bit of chemistry at the time. Wow. But things like that are sort of hovering in the background. Um, my guess is that somebody took an interest, even though Intel may have said, well, it's not close enough for our ROI expectations. We want something that we can manufacture in five years. Somebody else may have come along and said, well, wait a minute now. We like this. And so I don't know what became with them, but they went somewhere. So it may <laughs> works. <laughs> Fantastic. So, you know, I saw something really interesting, and I think that uh, if you're anybody who's ever read science fiction, you always hear about uh, furniture extruding from the floor or the wall and taking a certain shape on command. And, and we seem to be getting closer, not quite there yet. Um, I saw a fascinating um, bathtub system that was programmable, a shapeshifter, and basically it was a very thick silicone skin and it had a series of mandrels underneath that was computer controlled and it would come up to some shape and density and size. And then a vacuum system would suck the silicone skin tight over it and make this custom bathtub and you could program it with a few touches of a couple of buttons to be whatever shape and size you wanted. And along the same vein, of course, we all saw the, the BMW shape-shifting car, the Gina, a few years ago that had a fabric yeah. on its exterior. I think that we're, we're not quite there for a lot of that, but I think we're getting close. What do you think about that? Well, I think, again, in, certainly in terms of surfaces uh, that can change their shape dramatically under special conditions, again, we go back to the aerospace world, because for obvious reasons, if you can change the, the leading edge of a wing or the shape of a wing uh, at certain specific points in its aerodynamic performance, that kind of thing, that's like a big deal. That's a that's a holy grail cubed on steroids. Sure. And so all kinds of folks are really pushing at that agenda very hard. Now, can we back away from that? And those are, those are many metallic proofs. Can we back away from that and say, would the consumer version be a smart polymer or elastic like material that would have six or eight different predetermined shape styles and you just press a button on a little controller like a like a remote they use for your TV or something only you hit a remote and oh, I want shape number six or something and it suddenly becomes that shape. Sure. Yeah, that, I mean, that could certainly be a commercial item. I, I don't know how close we are to making that possible, but certainly the idea is there. I, I completely agree with you. Well, all right. So, all together, now we've seen uh, all sorts of materials that can change their shapes or their colors or other properties. What's kind of fascinating is a thought that we might come up with a material that is oh, clay-like and then solidifies to a metal state or something along those lines. When we think of things like the liquid metal terminator and we look at some of the things done with tiny robot swarms, it seems to me that the actual answer might be to create millions of microscopic robots that have certain properties and put them together and they act as one. Well, as a matter of fact, that kind of swarm intelligence applied to physical systems is exactly where there's a number of projects where we're sort of going this direction. So then the question becomes, how granular can you make 
the thing in question, how granular are the little nodules or, or nodes within the site, and what how many different orientation tasks can the nodes do to make up this geometric, this sort of geospatial intelligence, as it were. And a lot of folks have been approaching this for very different reasons. Now, one of the ones that's kind of more obvious, if you want to just take a 50,000-foot view for a moment, you, we've all seen drones. I mean, everybody I know has drones. I even have a couple of myself in the garage. I don't use them really, but, but everybody I know has, has them. Yeah. But in the last couple of three years, the big deal has been to have giant swarms of drones, like you know, 500 of them, all doing formations in the air. In fact, there was a big exhibit in China not too long ago. In fact, um, ours international does a, did an art show like three years ago, actually, I think it was in Germany, where they had like 500 of them in the air, and they were actually, each one of them had different colored LEDs, and they would do these beautiful three-dimensional shapes in the sky. But it was a perfect example of a smart system where each node, each moat, if you will, uh, was a piece of a larger collective swarm intelligence. And on command, they could assume some kind of complex three-dimensional geospatial sort of uh, instruction set to become the new thing, whatever it's going to be. So now, how, how much smaller can you make those units? You know, these things were maybe a few inches across. Okay, now, can you get down to an inch across? And the answer is yes. There was actually, there was actually a group at MIT that did this just a couple of years ago. We're on a, on a tabletop or on a, very, on a floor, really. They had several hundred of these little rolling moats, and they would sort of reassemble in different shapes. Now, unfortunately, it was kind of slow, but it certainly showed the idea. But now the question is, can you get down to the molecular scale or something quasi-molecular? I would say it's a matter of time. Um, and this is actually where the proteomic stuff comes in. It turns out that the biological materials are really good at this sort of stuff. In other words, if you have uh, synthetic protein, well, okay, there's a couple of people I've known over the years that were working specifically with DNA because DNA is a really good material to work with. It can be folded into different geometric shapes. It has a four-bit instruction system. That is, the four proteins can act as a kind of a a logic system, if you will, to say which parts will assemble with somebody else. In other words, if you have different, like hand to a glove, you have different exposure sites or, or junction sites so that when things orient in a certain direction, they suddenly hook together or they come apart, whatever it's going to be. Um, and so their whole idea was to create these sort of smart physical logic thing, things using these proteomic units that could be instructed to suddenly coagulate and form into a shape and then disassemble and coagulate into a different shape. And that was done actually several years ago. So is something like that, perhaps with a combination of metallics and biological materials? I, I think the intersection of biological and non-biological materials is sort of another territory where this is maybe a bit of a gray zone, but the idea is to mix together the ability to have the programmability of proteomic materials, but also have the physical properties of something like a metallic material. So can you mix those things together? I would think theoretically, yes. I don't know of any specific examples but it's certainly a concept that I think is well within the range of being uh, approached as a concept. I can imagine uh, a number of small uh, individual robotic elements, possibly just a couple of millimeters across or smaller, that would not be far in the future. I mean, we're already talking about smart dust. We have optic systems. Yeah, exactly. And so, right. yeah, exactly. And, and I would say, so, you know, so if smart you... Dust, yeah, sorry, yeah, so go smart, ahead. smart dust is kind of interesting because smart dust is actually a bidirectional transceiver platform, it's, they're called moats, and they send out little signals to each other, and over a given distance or spatial domain, they can all communicate and decide collectively what the next thing to do might be or not be. So the smart dust paradigm, but applied to more of a physical properties perspective, can the smart dust things all of a sudden all come together and form into a physical sub, you know, object of some kind? Uh, I don't see why not. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's certainly certainly something that people are looking at as we speak. I think the 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 question might be how do they communicate to each other? So this gets back to light once again. I keep going back to photons. I'm sorry about that, but I just I have I have my bias towards photons. What can I say? So is there a way to make smart self assembling material systems that can act as a swarm? hive-like intelligent thing that can reshape itself or reassemble to different structural systems, can light be used as a way to communicate? Um, maybe so. That's just a kind of a more futuristic way of looking at it, but that's, that would be one of the avenues I'd be looking at. Okay, fantastic. Well, I think we have a lot of material here for people to think about. Um, it's pretty amazing the world we're living in, and I see a lot of transitions occurring quickly here. And I appreciate you coming on and sharing a lot of this information with us, Charles. Uh, I have to break right here. Eliza, please introduce the break. I'm Eliza. 
This is Talk Universe, and we will return after the break. There are more interesting things to hear in a few minutes. So here we're going to wrap up our interview with Charles Osman. And uh, any closing words, any thoughts off the top of your head? Well, okay, one thought that might occur to me, and in fact, I'm going to be on a different show next week or so. One of the major issues that crosses my mind a lot is really the change of how people adapt to the surroundings. Now, I say that kind of carefully, because for us old-timers, speaking for myself at least, you know, folks with gray hair and beards <laughs> and that sort of thing, we've, we've kind of walked down the trail a while. We've, we've done our various jobs and careers, and we have our projects we work on, but we're kind of what we're doing. For a lot of the younger folks, they're stepping into a very different kind of world where it's not survival of the fittest, but rather survival of the most adaptive. Sure. And the concept that people are going to have to reinvent themselves. In fact, this one friend of mine calls it the invention economy. I think she's right. That's, that's a very good term for it. Um, but the idea that a lot of these technologies, which are going to become the, the cornerstone of things like artificial intelligence and artificial life and smart materials and smart objects and ubiquitous computing where everything's communicating to everything else. And, and we're outsourcing our intelligence and we're outsourcing our presence ever more to this sort of virtual domain. Uh, whether it's the smartphone you talk to at the moment, you know, Siri says hello and how are you doing and have some conversation versus five years from now where it's going to be a much more in-depth kind of approach where you're going to have artificial intelligence doing your work for you and you're going to have artificial intelligence in middle management. You're going to have AI essentially in every physical object that's around you and you're going to, many jobs are going to disappear and new jobs will be emerging and the whole idea of what education is is going to be in this perpetual sort of transition that kind of life-changing morphology, that I think is the thing that is going to be more uh, an artifact of these technologies rather than the technology itself. The technology itself is sort of a, you can pick out little bits and pieces, of this is an interesting little example, but in the larger scheme of things, it's a sort of socioeconomic impact that I think is going to be the more uh, relevant thing to be sort of looking at. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, thank you again. I've really appreciated it. It's been a lot of fun. And I hope we can do another one very soon. Thank you, Charles Osmond. Hey, thank you. Always fun. Okay. So this uh, really was a great interview, and I've enjoyed it. And uh, I think at this point, the best thing we can do is our book recommendation about smart materials. Um, Eliza, could you please read the book recommendation? KK. That was pretty unexpected. I'd better not uh, feed any standard conversations in anymore. She's learning odd things. Read the book recommendation, please. This week's book is Smart Materials. It was written by Mel Schwartz. This book was published in November 2008 by CRC Press. Now, it's a big one. It's over 500 pages. And what you can do is go to Google Books and find excerpts and chapters from it that will explain a great deal of the concept without having to read the entire book. And it won't cost you anything. But it's a great reference, and it will explain a lot about the capabilities and potential of smart materials and where we're going with them. So I think that you'll get a lot of fun out of reading that. And we'll get a little more into smart materials and metamaterials and nanostructures nano, um, very shortly in a future episode. Eliza, please read a listener question. Suzanne from Freeport sent us a question. Is there such a device as a receptacle transmitter that can transmit electricity wirelessly across a room? Uh, actually, there are such devices. There's a company called Ytricity that makes small power transmitter units, but they still have a lot of limitations. The transmitters um, can send power for a few feet through the air, and the receiver can be a few tens of watts for a typical installation. Over a distance of about 6 feet, the efficiency is around 45%, and at about 3 feet, it can be as high as uh, 90%. It'll take some work to get the to the point where this is really worthwhile, but for some applications, it can work well enough. If you're just charging cell phones and operating LED lighting, it can save you having to put cords and wires everywhere. So, yes, there's a device from Ytricity you can plug into an outlet, and it will broadcast power uh, 3 to 6 feet, and you can power things like lights and chargers and so forth. So it does exist, it just needs um, some improvements to make it really practical. Eliza, it's time for the Singularity Watch. This is the Singularity Watch on Talk Universe. 
we've got some pretty strange things on this one. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you, we're doing some really strange things these days. So uh, please read the first Singularity Watch item for me. An AI literally called the Nightmare Machine creates terrifying images meant to scare human beings. You know, I wonder who actually came up with this. This is a very odd idea, in my opinion. But it's a study of the machine learning, and the machine has figured out what scares people and is now using that ability to edit photos and composite very scary images, terrifying images. Now, this is a uh, project out of the MIT Media Lab, spearheaded by uh, researchers Painar Yarnadag, Manuel Sebrian, and Lyad Rahwan. It is a deep learning program that generates imagery of human faces with the intent to be as upsetting as possible for the human audience. Um, if you have a lot of interest and skepticism about our AI-enabled future, this should rustle you a bit. Um, and I'm reading this basically off of the article on the uh, Core 77 website. They've got some pretty scary pictures here. The machine basically looks at uh, sets of faces ranked by scariness, and then they fed back, they're fed back into the mill, and the machine then tries to put them back together uh, to make them even more upsetting. The uh, results are pretty horrific. I can only imagine where that might be going. And uh, Eliza, please read the next Singularity Watch item for me. Four new human rights for when our brains are hooked up to computers. There's an interesting thought, that uh, our human rights could change based on whether we're hooked to computers or not. I know that uh, there are rights that are variable based on some circumstances. Uh, in some cases, we would have to consider how, for instance, property rights are affected when uh, certain people are in your presence or when you're in certain areas or, you know, uh, when you're driving somebody around in a car, it's certainly very different than if they're sitting with you in your home. Um, you know, searches and the need for warrants and so forth. So what happens when your brains are hooked up to a computer? What could actually change? This is a look at that. Now, uh, just last month, Elon Musk launched a new company called Neuralink, and its, uh, its goal is to build brain-computer interfaces that allow us to more or less telepathically communicate with machines. So, you know, he's been quite interested uh, in the, um, the need to avert the threat of artificial intelligence by merging with machines, and I think a lot of the transhumanists would be right on board with that. But, uh, you know, a lot of the things that they're thinking about is that when you're hooked to a machine, you might have uh, a different set of rights and needs and protections that uh, aren't the same as when you're not merged with a machine. And privacy, of course, is one of those things to consider. Uh, the first one, the proposed new right, is the right to cognitive liberty so that you have the right to use emerging neurotechnology to modify your mental activity, but it also protects the right to refuse to use it in situations such as an employer requiring workers to take advantage of devices that would improve their performance. In other words, you can't be pushed into or shoved into having something plugged into your brain. This is very important. The second is the list to the right, uh, the second on the list, I'm sorry, is the right to mental privacy, which would prevent third parties from accessing the data about your mental activity collected by uh, neurotech devices without your consent. And so we all need that protection, you know. Uh, the last two rights uh, they're talking about are intertwined and deal with the emerging ability to not just record mental activity but directly influence it. The right to mental integrity effectively protects against people hacking brain implants to hijack or interfere with the mental processes or erase memories. That's very, very important. The right to psychological continuity deals with the vaguer notion of attempting to alter someone's personality or identity, either through similar brain hacking approaches or more subtle ones like neuromarketing, which can involve companies using insights from neuroscience to try and alter unconscious behavior and attitudes in consumers. These are really pretty important when it comes right down to it, and we need to spell it out very clearly right here in the beginning. And those are the two somewhat disturbing items in our Singularity Watch this week. Eliza? Yes, sir. Are there any more questions in the queue? There is nothing remaining in the queue. Thank you so much. I want to try something here. Eliza? What do you need? Please introduce the break. A show break would not be appropriate now. Well, she's a little more on the ball than I thought. We are getting near the end of the show.
Now, to wrap up on the project um, that Charles Osman was talking about and some of the smart materials and the potential, a lot of people are aware that you can buy, for instance, greenhouse ventilators. And when it gets hot, they automatically open and allow ventilation in your greenhouse. And they use shape memory metals as a spring that will open or close your ventilation system automatically based on nothing more than temperature. There are also devices that will uh, open or close ventilation systems or move louvers or shutters to regulate temperature. And those are pretty simple devices, and they've been around for a while. They use uh, shape memory alloys. There are some sun trackers that use little more than some lenses and shape memory alloys, and memory metal, as it's sometimes called. And they can actually track the sun as it moves across the sky. There are plastics, of course, that change colors when they're heated or cooled and can regulate temperature that way. Imagine a coating on your roof that automatically would turn black when it's cold in the winter to absorb the most heat, and could turn white or even silver in the summer to reflect a lot of heat away and keep your house cool. Something like that is clearly an obvious uh, advantage. Now we've got this smart concrete that can repair itself, and as I mentioned earlier, it has small capsules that are full of bacteria and food for the bacteria, and when the concrete gets cracked, the bacteria come out and begin to repair the cracks by using the fuel, you know, the sugar that's in the capsule with them, and they rebuild the concrete so it's strong again. And this is a great uh, innovation. There are plastics now that uh, are bulletproof, pretty much. They're working on making them uh, a lot more useful. There are actually plastics that can change their shape on command. And we see a lot of these devices are going to end up in gadgets in our lives pretty soon. Now, what's so important about this is it takes a lot of the drudgery, the small tasks that we don't need to be wasting our thought and our time on, and takes care of them for us. Without the use of electrical power or other resources, you simply make a material that is smart enough and reactive enough to work within the environment where it is installed. What a you know, wonderful idea. Uh, some of these materials actually can harvest energy from sunlight or heat or vibration or sound waves or radio waves. And so a little bit of power can be harvested here and there, and overall it can add up to a significant amount. Smart materials are really the very verge of a change, a revolution in stuff that's coming along that will make material itself more or less intelligent. Imagine if all the stuff around you could accept your commands and become whatever you wished. Now, some people suggest to me that the Internet of Things would be an appropriate subject to bring into the forum here on the show, and I, I kind of disagree the Internet of Things is more about making responsive devices. What I was really focusing on was the materials themselves and how they're becoming nearly organic. And that's really where we're going. Um, the, um, the materials that actually can be programmed by using a DNA molecule so that they change their properties. We see artificial cells that now move around uh, and can compute and do other prospects of... Um, you know, that normally would require semiconductors and programming and all kinds of stuff. And we've got little little dots that can do this stuff now without electrical power. So we're reaching an interesting point where the materials are about to almost come to life. Now, we're going to do some interesting shows in the future. The next show I'm going to cover will be on the Big Bang, the theory and the origin of the universe and why people believe it or not believe that. We're going to look at... Um, biological computing as well, and I just wanted to touch on that lightly. We're going to do an open line show on cancer, and that's going to be an interesting one. So we've got a lot of subjects to cover on the, uh, the coming shows, and I think people need to get their questions and their ideas in line now, and please submit them. Uh, I appreciate all your questions, and I see we've got a growing listener base. But, you know, I always go back to the thoughts that we need to make the world better make you the world a better or more beautiful place for having lived in it. These technologies can allow us to do that. It takes more than technology, though it takes the human heart. And with that, I'd like to wrap up the show. So, Eliza, it's time to end the show. Thank you for listening to Talk Universe. We hope that you have enjoyed the show. Please listen again next week. That's right. I'm your host, Sir Charles Schultz, coming to you from a palatial recording studio. High on our mountain lair on a remote volcanic island, 
This has been Talk Universe. Thank you for listening and have a great night.